of radioactivity in particles, uh, we're looking at radiation and half-life. Now I'll very quickly just mention how we detect ionizing radiation. I'll briefly talk about background radiation before explaining half-life in detail. Now, when ionizing radiation, alpha and beta and gamma is emitted, um, we can detect it using, say for example, a Geiger-Muller tube. Now a Geiger-Muller tube on the front of it has a very thin, a very thin sheet of mica. And as the particle, the, the radiation penetrates that, inside there is a gas. Now when the gas, when, when the alpha particle, the beta particle, the gamma, collides with the gas inside the Geiger-Muller tube, what happens is it ionizes the gas. So the electrons are removed from the gas. Now when this happens, inside the Geiger-Muller tube we have a potential difference. So all of a sudden we've got gas atoms which were neutral which are now charged. We have a positively charged part and a negatively charged part. So they go to the corresponding positive and negatively charged terminals and that gives us a small electrical current, a very small pulse. And that meet, that's detectable and that shows us that radiation has entered the Geiger-Muller tube and ionized the gas inside it which gives us a reading as we get a small flow of current. Now, in addition to detecting radiation, we need to remember that we've got background radiation all around us and it's given off from cosmic rays, from rocks, from food, from medical uses. Uh, radon gas is a, is a very, very big contributor to background radiation. Nuclear power stations are not a big contributor. They are an artificial source of background radiation, but they do not contribute very much whatsoever. When we do calculations based on half-life, for example, it's important to consider background radiation. So, for example, if I was to use a Geiger-Muller tube and I was to detect the amount of radioactivity given off by a particular sample, now I might read it as 100 counts per minute and say the activity of the sample is 100 becquerels or 100 counts per minute. Um, or counts per second. But if I did not take into account background radiation, this would not be a true reading. Because if background radiation was 10, then I would have to remove background radiation. I'd have to account for that prior to taking my reading. So if background radiation was 10, and I did a, a reading of 100, I'd need to subtract the 10 in order to get an accurate reading for the sample after considering background. Now, this half-life is very important, so I just want to talk you through half-life. If we think about a sample here, we've got a sample of 100 red atoms. Now, the 100 red atoms are going to decay. Now, we know that decay is caused because atoms are unstable, or nuclei are unstable. Now, it's a spontaneous, random event, and we can never predict when any of these particular nuclei will decay. However, we can say with some certainty overall how many will decay in a given time. Now whilst we cannot look at any particular nucleus and say it will decay now or then, as a sample, especially if the sample is large, we can begin to understand it statistically the decay for it. So if we look at this, at the moment it's the green balls they, they are demonstrating the activity of the sample, the amount of radiation given off. These are particles of radiation. And once the, they turn from red to blue, they have decayed their alpha or their beta radiation, and they are now stable. They're no longer unstable. They've given off the radiation, and now they're stable. Now, when we look at a particular atom, we can never tell if it will decay now, or now, or now. You can't tell. This could theoretically go on all day. Now we saw then that the whole sample disappeared after a given time. Now if we were to do this again, this time I want us to look here. We've got a hundred red, red nuclei and, a and no blue ones. When I start this again, oh almost, I want to stop it so I've got half of them remaining. Now it took four and a half seconds for half of those nuclei to decay. That means the half-life of this sample is four and a half seconds. The half-life is the time taken 
for the amount of radioactive substance to decay to half its original value. For the mass of the radioactive elements to fall to half its original value. This is the half-life. So currently it's on 50 in four and a half seconds. So if I let it run again, hopefully we'll find in roughly another four and a half seconds, this should be about 25. Okay, so roughly another four and a half seconds, it's halved. In another four and a half seconds, this will halve again. So if we think about this, another four and a half seconds, this should go down to about 12. Okay, and again, in about four seconds, it went down, it halved again. And because our sample is just 100 atoms, we don't get great level of accuracy. However, if this was a billion atoms, then the statistics would really, really show us the half-life. Now, you might see half-life on a half-life graph. So if we were to think about the axis of a graph, this axis here is time, and this axis here is the number of radioactive nuclei. The number of radioactive nuclei. So to start with, if we have, say, a hundred, this would mean that in one half life, the number of radioactive nuclei remaining would fall to half of that. Now in the first instance, I'm not going to count background radiation. So hundred, half of a hundred would be 50. So if this here was measured in hours, Oh, seconds. So this might be 10, 20, 30, and so on. If the half-life was about 20 seconds, then we could put a point there. Half of 50 is 25, so we could put a point about there. In another half-life, half of 25 is 12, so we put another one about there, then 6, and three, and so on. So what we find is, our graph shows this exponential decay. And we can see, if we go to half our original value, we see the half-life is 20, and if we halve that again, we can see, sorry, 50, and if we go to 25, we can see that's another half-life, and we can keep doing this to see that each one of those it halves every half-life. Now, another way of seeing this with half-life will be to think of this situation. In reality, the graph would decay like this. Now, a question in the exam, you could determine half-life from the graph, but a question in the exam might say, why does the graph level out at this point here? And of course, the reason would be, the reason it levels out and doesn't go any less than this number would be because of background radiation. Because background radiation means that it will always stay at a certain value. So when we're looking at graphs, if the graph does not levels out with a gap before zero, that's because of background radiation. Okay? It's important we remember background radiation and that half-life is the time taken for the number of radioactive nuclei to fall to half their original value.